<laughs> Mind you, Jaws 2, I find a very underrated horror film. Uh, as much. Jaws, yeah, Jaws, Jaws 2 is perfectly so. As, as much as uh, a giant shark is a horror film, I suppose it must be. Uh, definitely. Because I think people are. It's very difficult for things like Jaws 2 and Robocop 2 to distance itself from its first film. Well, I mean, Jaws 1, let's not bit around the bush here. It's one of the best films ever. Probably in the top five films ever made. So, to follow that is a, a big ask. So, it's like, things like that, like, it's a huge film that changed the landscape of cinema as we know it. Well, yeah, I mean, not to overstate it, it is a bit like going, here's a pitch for you, Casablanca 2. Like, you couldn't do it. <laughs> you couldn't fucking do it. But no. Because a horror film is just like, ah, we'll just make... Another one with a shark. Like you could, you feel like you can do it. But Jaws, like Jaws Two is okay. Jaws it's a good Two film. is quite good. It still deals it's with not, um, the it's sheriff. Just not something. Yeah, Brody still uh, still yeah. in it. And it's like he actually has like a form of post traumatic stress disorder. It's like the fil- the first film had consequences. It's not like another installment. It's Although like... it, I mean, the, the fact that Brody is there is almost to the film's detriment, though. What's that? Because it is like, oh, this one man who is just terrorised by sharks <laughs> for his entire life, like. Uh, Although I suppose I suppose Quint was in the first one. So. Mind you, it's not as bad as the fourth one, where the shark goes after the ex-wife no, no, and manages, nothing is as bad as the fourth one. <laughs> and managed to get across like half of the fucking Atlantic. <laughs> nothing is as bad as John with a roaring Dylan. shark and Michael McGain and. Uh, the, the fact that Jaws the Revenge is probably Michael Caine's worst film is quite an achievement because Michael Caine has been in some shite. He said, like, why did you go for Jaws 4? Well, I have never seen that film, but I've seen the house it bought. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he is that kind. I mean, Michael Caine's kind of a prick in real life. but I love Apparently him. so, yeah. He's a terrific, terrific actor. But um, my favourite scene in Jaws the Revenge, there's a bit where Michael Caine's character falls out of a boat and they pull him back into the boat just in time and he's fucking bone dry like he's, yes. he's not even remotely damp he's just been in the sea apparently Michael Caine wasn't even called Michael Caine until last year he literally what, changed legal? his name legally he literally changed... he's legally he's legally changed his name to Michael Caine yeah because his name was something else and every time he it's, was... uh, his, his real name is um, Morris Micklewhite you probably know that better than I do because he got sick of having to travel across uh, borders and everybody going like, hang on, you look like Michael Caine. This passport can't be right. And he's like, ah, fine, I'll change my name, you dickbags. I'll find you. <laughs> has he, has your... he legally change it to Sir Michael Caine? You happy now? Are you fucking happy now? <laughs> well, I didn't know that. That's weird. Ah, uh, it's one of my favourite um, bits ever on YouTube because I don't know where what show it came from. It's Rob Brydon and um Oh it's uh Coogan. It's the it's from the trip. I know exactly what you're talking the about. The trip? It's... What is the trip? The trip is a sitcom where Coogan and Bryden played they basically played fictionalized versions of themselves. Right, because I never felt like they were playing characters. I thought it was just them. It is it is I mean, I don't even know if they're called Steve and Robin the Shaw, but I mean it's them. It's just fictionalized. Um and they're doing a trip across there's a few seasons now I think the first one's across, just across Britain and it's just them basically I think probably most of it was ad-libbed oh my god but that scene where they're sitting across each other and they're doing they're both their own Michael Caine impersonation they, they, ar- they argue about the correct way to do a Michael Caine impersonation no but you'll ha- you have to go like a little bit <laughs> Have to go no, no. Like, no, fuck, no, fuck it. Let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah, yeah. You fucking... you have to... <laughs> it's so brilliant. You, you have to do so the whisper, brilliant. like the whisper. Like, I love. No, uh, no, Mr. It's Wayne. good because you know Coogan started out as a impressionist, and then he moved away from that when he made it big with Alan Partridge and stuff. Okay. And so now, any time when you get to see him do the impressionist stuff again, it's, oh my god, he's doing the impressions. Because Rob Brydon does it fucking like you can't stop Rob Brydon doing impressions. <laughs> he, he, he he will do that shit whether you want him to or not. That's non negotiable. Didn't the two of but, them make out on an episode of QI or when I think of someone else? Prob- probably. Probably it sounds like something they would have done. They were like, oh, uh, somebody was sitting across them and like, I was confused for a moment because you said Rob, but then the other one answered. It's like a schism in reality. This is like Time Cop. And then 
they're like, oh, we'll just make out, and then they started snogging. That's yeah, that sounds like something they would do. Um, but yeah, like like anytime you get to see Coogan doing impressions and shit now, it's always a, a real thrill for me because. He never did it anymore. So the trip was great because he did a lot of that shit. It was just him and Rob. Coogan also has a great um, little man stuck in a bottle voice. No, that's Rob Ryan. Oh, fuck me. See, now I'm doing it. <laughs> he does the, yeah, he, he does the uh, uh, man trapped in a box, I think he calls it, is it? Yeah. It's fucking amazing, yeah. Absolutely incredible. There's a Dutch comedian called Hans Tewen. Uh He does some American stand-up as well because, he, well, English stand-up, but he goes to America for it. But he does it in America. He's like, uh, I don't want to uh, alarm you or anything, but I think uh, genocide is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing job. <laughs> it is. <laughs> anyway, but in, in the Dutch, he goes like, oh, uh, I, I used to have an uncle. And he would used to do like a dwarf stuck in a bottle. And he would hold a bottle to his mouth and be like, help me, help me. And then the audience would be laughing and like, <laughs> and then, oh yeah, and then he would pass out like 10 minutes because he couldn't breathe anymore. It's, oh, it's actually still. Because <laughs> his uncle would be like holding the bottle to his mouth. He's like, uh, 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 we never saw him after that. <laughs> Hans Thierwin is probably my favorite Dutch comedian that I wish that I could show to more people abroad, but you'd have to watch him with subtitles because he doesn't do a lot of English stuff. Right, he's really, you know, there's people like that skirt the border of what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah, he fucking demolishes that border. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to have an affair with somebody in the in the royal house, so uh, I'd be fucking her up the ass, and then uh, afterwards, she, uh, yeah, I'd be like, hey, Majesty, get me some fucking beer. And she'd crawl away from me with a beating ass. It's like what the fuck you can't say that. Have you ever have you ever heard of um, Jerry Salowit? No. He's a Scottish comedian. He actually he almost made it really big in the late nineties, but it's basically impossible to put his his stuff on TV. Um, he he sounds fairly similar to Jerry Salowit. Like Jerry Salowit's opening gag for his Edinburgh show one year was Mother Teresa, what a cunt. <laughs> that, was his, that was his opening joke. That was his opening line. Like I remember seeing Eddie Izzard talk about it, and he was like, "I remember watching him be like, fucking hell, you can't say that, can you?'" Well, he just said it. Maybe she's a cunt. <laughs> um, he went. He wants, uh, I probably would compare it the most to Frankie Boyle. Fra- um, fra- like to Frankie always seemed to me like a poor man's Jerry Sadowitz because he. Well, I'd have I haven't seen I, Jerry Sullivan, so after. No, I know. I, I like I like Frankie a lot. I've been to see him live and everything. I love Frankie, but people like when he first got on TV, there was this thing, especially in Britain here, where people were like, "Oh my God, I, I can't believe this man is saying these things." And it was like, "Well, I've seen a different Scottish comedian who said way worse things than this, like, <laughs> li- literally a year ago." So I don't know why it's so unthinkable. That it just seemed weird that he got picked. For TV and Jerry Sadowitz never. It always seemed probably odd to me. because the Jerry fella then you know went a little bit too far and Frankie could. He got uh, he, he had a, he had a, he had a show on Channel Five for a little while, which was half stand up, half magic tricks, and it didn't really work. It was a bit weird, a bit clunky. I, the thing with Jerry Sadowitz is though, he was never cut out for TV. Frankie was very good on telly. It, uh, it definitely Jerry helped. Jerry was on Mock the Week as well. Yeah, and that, I think. That's Frankie's big leg up is that he's satirical. He's always had an agenda to his comedy. He's always been very current affairs. Whereas Jerry Sadowitz is almost it's almost this machine gun that's just turned on the entire world. It's just this torrent of anger and bile. Um, I mean, my my, my favourite ever like he, he once he played a festival in Canada. Uh, obviously, it's a big comedy scene in Canada, isn't it? And um, he was I think it was even the, the Montreal festival even. He was doing this routine and he was like, I fucking hate Canada. I absolutely fucking hate coming to Canada. I hate it. It's the worst country in the world. Half of you think you're fucking French and speak French and the other half fucking let them. He was like, that, that's purely to the Canadian audience. That's, that's, that, that is a bit he's only <laughs> The other half that. fucking let them. <laughs> yeah. he, he's, he's only written that for that Canadian audience. Being just deliberately belligerent. Like, I love it. He, in, in, in Scotland, he was like, I love playing in Scotland. Not because people are nice here people are still going to complain about my show but I know they're not going to send me letters about it because that would require buying a fucking stamp <laughs> that's bad but it's uh, uh, 
I'm looking up Salinger, you said, like A L I N G E R? No, Sadowitz. So it's S A D O W I C Z. Oh, curly hair man. Curly hair man. Looks a bit like Slack. Yeah, he does a little bit. Hmm. Ah, okay, fair enough. I think I've. Yeah, he's great. He's he's a torrent of rage and abuse. I've he's seen great. him come <laughs> by at one point, but I've never, you know. Mind you, I mean, nothing you've told me so far has really offended me or anything. I'm quite good with stuff like that. It's like one well, of my favourite I mean, jokes is when uh, Frankie Boyle's like, "Ah, oh, the other day I found out they put rape in predictive text. Like, Why would you put that in predictive text? Like, sorry, mum, won't be on for dinner." Gone raping, and then somebody, <laughs> and then somebody gets up out of the audience and walks off. He's like, "Oh, well, I know what he's going to do tonight." <laughs> That's fucking awful. <laughs> but yeah, Hans Taylor, he's got stuff like that out of the wazoo. He does that constantly. But he he changes it up with absurdism. Like he'll he'll have something really offensive and really like. You can't do that on television, kind of stuff. And the other time, you'll just be talking about like, yeah, 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 no, uh, I, I, uh, I tried making an appointment at a batcher the other day. I'll be like, uh, grab him in the forest. I'm like, <laughs> couldn't get him still. And he was like, same time tomorrow. And he put it down. He's like, did you think I saw him again? Same time tomorrow? No. <laughs> it's like what the fuck well that's pretty like my favourite Frankie Boyle joke I'm going to mangle it because I can't remember it properly but he's on about you know trying to convince kids to eat greens yeah and you tell them lies it's like don't you want to grow up to be big and strong you can eat, eat your broccoli and he's like why stop there why not be like eat your broccoli don't you want to grow up to be able to project the bat signal out of your Jap's eye <laughs> and, then, and then like he starts laughing himself and he's like sorry I've just said that on the spot I didn't mean to say that. He's like, I was just started imagining what it'd be like. Like, Batman had come running up. What's the trouble, citizen? I've eaten too many bro- I've eaten too much broccoli, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite Frankie Boyle bit is uh, he had a show on Channel Four called To Liga Nights. Uh, Channel Four Nights. Yeah, that's it. And Chamber he's at one point he has got a skit, and it's making fun of Night Rider. It's yes, a, it's amazing. It's a, his night rider is a drug addict, and he's like in a car going. Doo, 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 doo. He's like, "What's there, that?" There appear, kid? Be, there, there appear to be two people smoking crack in that alleyway, Michael. <laughs> Wait, now there are three people smoking crack. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, kid? <laughs> He's like the best bit is when he's like sick down the window because <laughs> he he sells kit to buy a new like to buy crack. So he's driving a regular car. Like, windows kit, windows, but the windows don't roll down because it's a regular car. He's just like spews down the inside of the fucking <laughs> so bleak. Oh, oh dear, maybe. oh dear. Yes. Uh. Ah, but uh, so, uh, speaking of stand-ups, we touched on Holy Fools and Horses earlier. I showed you some Stuart Lee stuff recently. Um, well, uh, you mentioned him. Uh, you, uh, you said it, he does American comedy earlier about uh, that the, the, the Dutch fellow. Yes. Um, and you, presumably you meant he does English comedy, but he does it in America. Yes. Stuart, Stuart Lee does a routine about what American comedians are actually like. And he says that all American comedians, all American comedians, right, this is their act, every single one of them. My mom was Irish and my dad was Jamaican. So when I see a pineapple, I don't know whether to eat it or stick it up my ass. That's every American comedian. Oh, oh, my, my dad was French and my mom was Dutch. So when I see a baguette, I don't know whether to eat it or stick it up my ass. I... Every American comedian, that's every American comedian. He said that the Montreal film, for, uh, Montreal Comedy Festival is just that for two two weeks. And the first week is in English and the second week is in French. I don't quite get it, but I get the implication. The impl- I think the implication is just that American comedians just swear in lieu of telling jokes, which I've always found to be true. It, it is, kind of. I mean, like, um, like you know, if Kevin I compare Dutch comedians to British ones, it's like British ones, uh, Dutch are very often telling stories like about about their life and they interperse it with like music and very often they sing as well because we expect them to for some reason it's like a part of their cabaret because we don't call them comedians we call them cabarets 
You've got to be a full on troubadour. To yeah, it. something like that. And British comedians is like a um, little bit, a little bit about their lives, but mostly about like slightly insultive. Quite good. I quite like uh, most British comedians, but American ones, I don't really. I can't really think of anybody. I'm like, oh yeah, I could watch several bits about him. I love, um, I love Bill Burr. Bill Burr is one of my favourite comedians in the world. Um, he's probably my favourite American. I went to see him in London actually uh, last year. Fucking, oh, sorry, the other fall he was dynamite. Um, he's probably my favourite American comedian. Um, I know Bill. Burr. Like I, li- yeah. I like the the older comics. Um, like I was always a big fan of Bill Hicks, but I don't actually find him that funny. I don't. I Not almost think of him as a. Hicks. Yeah, I almost think of him as like a philosopher. <laughs> more than anything do you know what I mean like he, he's, he's like a modern day philosopher really he just comes on stage and sort of tells the truth in a comedic way criticises the government or whatever like I don't actually find his stuff that funny um it's like, I always thought Richard yeah. I always thought Richard Pryor was really funny I mean yeah Richard Pryor is good but it's like stuff like I wouldn't say he's very unique when I compare to when Eddie Murphy did stand up no but then and I don't that's, wanna, again, that's I don't the, want to say like that's the play, that it's just cultural differences, isn't it? It is, but I mean, the thing with Richard Pryor is, like, I think he's similar to, like, you know, that it's the Pythons and Beatles thing again, where everyone that followed him, it, they just do what Richard Pryor did. Like, he, he he set that blueprint out of, like, what American comedy is. Like, they do... Like, Eddie Murphy stuff, like you said, it's the same. Like, they, he doesn't really tell jokes. He does, like, almost, like, characters and little vignettes and little routines. Yeah. And that's what Richard Pryor did. Like, and it's... And Bill, Bill Bird is the same thing. Like, they tell little stories and they play little characters, like little one-man plays. <laughs> so almost. we are suffering from that was... quite literally the same effect when it comes to Monty Python that people from America have. So we're just seeing all these current comedians... And well, no, because like, I think the, I think the new ones are terrible, and Richard Pryor is brilliant. Because <laughs> like he's actually funny, whereas Kevin oh, Hart just oh, goes ah, ah, like that. Yeah, I don't like Kevin Hart. No, Kevin Hart's what, what, fucking what, yeah, uh, but, but what I mean is that we see them and we're like, I don't get the appeal, but it's like, but to them it was very formative during like a quintessential part of history. Like, uh, well, no, because I mean I like Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy, but well, the yeah, new ones. Yeah. Dire. <laughs> I don't. I don't think anyone's ever going to say Kevin Hart was like a big part of their formative years. No one. No one is ever going to go. Oh man, Jumanji changed my life. Ah, uh, we meant to say that, didn't we? I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> Apparently, it's doing quite well. I didn't. F- yeah, that's not a guarantee of quality. But you know what? As soon as it comes on video on demand, we should have a go at it. <sighs> okay. It's still fucking playing in the cinemas over here. But I think it is. I think it is here. Yeah. Let me put it like this: I'm I I don't have a lot of money to go around uh, these couple of months, so I'm not going to spend it on going to the cinema, buying a ticket, buying refreshments, and seeing to see a film you don't want to see, and seeing Jumanji <laughs> when I've still got to see Black Panther, which is one of the apparently most important films of the year so far. I am having a hard time believing the hype around Black Panther because it is. <clears throat> I, I mean it's very easy you know what the thing is it's culture you and I are both very Caucasian as fuck and we won't have the same experience that people with African heritage have but people are saying it's like the best all ever <laughs> like, they get it to be. but everybody has their own personal best film ever no but I mean fucking white people <laughs> it's like oh it's better than the Avengers it can't be it's probably not going to be, be better than the Avengers <laughs> Can't be like it's ninety nine. Is it still? It might not be now. I know for week one it was like ninety nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh yeah, and the one guy that's who n- did like the one bad review or like that said it was like a per- five out of ten. He got that's fucking hounded perfect. for it. That can't be accurate. It can't be. No film's that good. But the point is with uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't say like the quality of the film. It's just like um, a counter for like the amount of positive reviews. An amount of poor reviews. It's a good barometer, though. So know. I could say, like, uh, I could have a film with 100% Rotten Tomatoes rating, but all of the reviews would be like six out of ten, three out of t- three out of five. But I could have like the 50-50 one, which saying like, oh, this film is like four out of ten, but the other reviews would be like ten out of ten. So it wouldn't mean that it's better than the rest just because it's positive on Rotten Tomatoes and I think a lot of people lose that out of sight I guess I think it, but it's a good it's usually a good thumbstick it's usually a good benchmark yeah I, I suppose like, 
But I mean, at, at the time when everyone was going, it's ninety nine percent for it. That was when it was no um, user reviews. It was only critics. Mind you, people put too much faith in that kind of thing anyway. Oh, they do. They absolutely do. The best thing to um, do is find um, online reviewers that kind of match up with your taste and be like, yeah. What this guy usually likes, I usually like. So if he likes it, I'll probably like it. I have that. Enough. I hope people have that with what we put out, what I put out. And that's the best thing to do it. It's not like you can't get pissed off because it's got a 6 out of 10 from some bloke who you never even fucking heard of. Because that's dumb. That being said, I hope Black Panther is good and it's got Andy Circus in it. And I'm confident it will be good. And I'm excited to see it. Considering I don't really like the character that much, I'm very excited to see this film. I really like the Christopher Priest run, but aside from that, I can take or leave the character. The Christopher Priest run is just written so cleverly. It's just alongside John Byrne's She-Hulk, which is admittedly a lot more silly. It's one of the best um, arcs or runs that telegraph and set up things way in advance that come into play way later... But because the story consistently, continually evolves and changes, um, if it had happened like straight off the bat, it wouldn't have had the same effect as it would have had three issues later. But because it happened three issues later, the story has a lot more impact that way. And that's what's great about the Christopher Priest one. It's like, it just sets up all these pawns and then it's like, bing, hang on, you were not expecting that one. We're going back to this bit and it's fantastic. And this is why I hate the original Hudlin run so much. Oh, uh, I mean, I mean, to be fair, I think a lot of my ambivalence to all Black Panther in general stems from that period. <sighs> the fuck, I hated that run so like because I, I originally I didn't really feel strongly one way or another about Black Panther. I was like, oh, he's he's just a character. He's there. So I, you know, I didn't read the books. He was fine when he popped up in other you know crossovers, or whatever. But the Hudlin stuff. So fucking bad. And there's a there's a board out there, a community. I'm not gonna name them, and <laughs> they love they love him so much over the Christopher Priest run because they say he's a lot more black in the Hudlin run, which is saying a bit. It's just a bit harsh because Christopher Priest was the first black person to write for Marvel, and the first person right. to be their editor for something. Hmm. and he's still one of the most prominent black writers out there and he actually quit writing because he realised people were casting him as the black writer who writes the black characters oh my god he was the Dave Chappelle of comics that's basically what he saw as himself as yeah? so he quit writing for a bit and he only came back recently when he got big name titles he's doing Justice League at the moment if I'm not mistaken and Justice League that's cool. is quite fucking a titular flagship for DC Comics. Well, yeah, huge. It's a far cry from saying, like, oh, uh, yeah, you want to do Luke Cage? Yeah. Yeah. Cause he, he... You, can write, you can write Cyborg, I guess. <laughs> Basically that. So, Christopher Priest is just way more the, the run he had intelligently set up and interlinked as opposed to Hudlin, which was the greatest hits of, let's just go to this bit of the Marvel comic universe and have Black Panther fight Doctor Doom because and he beats he beats that guy because look look how good Black Panther is and he marries Storm def- because Storm it, is black. It did. I remember being on uh, you know on comic book forums and boards around that time, and it did get really ugly with certain individuals arguments being made about oh it's only because he like had to make the black guy look powerful and stuff like. But regardless of race or whatever, if there was any character. Just doing all these crossovers where he just beats everyone else just to look good. Like, oh man, it's it was so fucking bad. Don't put it like this. His first arc he wrote, Claw, a Dutch person, suddenly was Belgian. Uh, the radiation, radioactive man, or radiate, no, radioactive man. Um, I, I don't want to confuse him with the Simpsons character. <laughs> Marvel has a villain from China. Whose powers are based in radiation? It's either radiation, radioactive. I don't know. Fuck. Hang on. Ten seconds. 